everyone, it's Melissa Sweet here, Public Health Journalist from Croaky Blog. Um, we're coming to you today from Ngunnawal Country on the ANU campus in Canberra. And I've just sat in on a most wonderful, um, invigorating talk by Dr. Kyle White, who's here visiting, um, and I'll just get him to introduce himself. Could you tell us who you are, please, and what you've just been talking about? Uh, I'm Kyle White, and I teach in the Departments of Philosophy and Community Sustainability at Michigan State University and hold the Timnick Chair in the Humanities. Uh, I'm Potawatomi and an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, which is a federally recognized tribe in the United States. Uh, and most of my research and educational activities are about uh, indigenous peoples and climate change. And you had a packed audience and they're very um, engaged in one of your messages, I think, if I've taken it correctly, is that climate change is not a new matter for Indigenous peoples. Can you explain why that's so? Yeah, so when we say that climate change is not new for Indigenous people, there's a couple of uh, respects uh, that we mean. So the, the first one is that uh, for Indigenous people, actually, uh, for most at least, uh, we've always understood our societies as interrelated with the environment and having to adapt to environmental change. So many indigenous cultures were highly seasonal and also sought to record and remember changes across different years. So the idea that humans would impact the environment and also impact the climate system and that those systems impact us is not a new idea. Uh, the second respect has to do with the fact that most indigenous people experience some form of colonialism by countries such as Australia and the United States. And if you look in detail at the history of colonialism, you'll actually see that it inflicted uh, climate change and environmental change on indigenous people. So for example, when many areas that indigenous people relied on that were forested were then deforested or swamps were dried, um, that changes the, uh, the, the temperature actually, right? It tem changes the habitat. It, it, it creates changes that indigenous people have to adjust to, which are actually very similar to the types of changes that indigenous people are gearing up for with respect to what today we call uh, climate change. Um, and so in this sense, many indigenous people have been through multiple rounds of human-caused environmental and climate change, not necessarily caused by uh, emissions, uh, but caused by other ways in which humans can force other humans to have to adapt to new environments and new climates. And related to that, you made a very strong critique of the concept of the Anthropocene. Would you like to explain that? Yeah, so one of the issues I have is that, you know, on the one hand, there's a sort of scientific definition of the Anthropocene that geologists use. So they're trying to figure out whether we're in a new uh, geological epoch. But then the Anthropocene has also captured the imagination. And for many conservationists, they either view the uh, Anthropocene as referring to a climate altered future that will lead to extinctions and loss of, of habitat and it's very dreadful and dystopian and that we need to do whatever we can to to, to stop um, you know or they uh, just think that you know we're gonna have to figure out what uh, plants or animals we can save and, and what ones we should uh, let go of um, and that we need to try to make decisions that are best for human societies and so it struck me about how a lot of people were talking about the Anthropocene is it just was relying on a different conception of history uh, than indigenous people have. So consider the first uh, meaning just as an example. Um, for indigenous people, um, we've already been through the apocalypse, we've already been through the dystopia, and we're living in a dystopia right now. We've already lost hundreds of plants, animals, and insects and habitats we relied on, and while the actual you know, say a plant itself may not be extinct globally, it's extinct to us when it's no longer accessible. Um, and so in that sense, we're not making decisions based on the absolute dread of, you know, losing an iconic uh, species. We're actually trying to figure out how to rebuild our societies given we've already lost so much. And so what I've tried to show in my work is that that gives us a different perspective on what the Anthropocene means. And it's also the case of just the idea that human collective actions uh, impact the environment and the, there's you know, cyclicality and feedback and so on is again an idea that's really old in many indigenous cultures. It's not something that, that's new. So while I don't think there's anything that say 
you know, incorrect about the notion of the Anthropocene. Uh, it's more the case that it just arises from a different history. Um, and for conservationists especially to avoid what they did to indigenous people when they established the national parks <laughs> and displaced many indigenous people, they're going to have to think about how people who have very different historical perspectives can work together. So you made that point about the importance of climate scientists understanding the true history of colonialism and how that you know, plays out to make Indigenous peoples more vulnerable to climate change. Could you, you gave us some examples about that. Could you perhaps talk to one of those examples? So, you know, climate scientists have been extremely interested in the fact that you know, Indigenous people actually know quite a bit about climate change that climate scientists just wouldn't have access to because they're primarily doing studies at a, a regional scale and don't have a lot of long-term experience in a particular locality. And so there's this you know, great idea that climate scientists and indigenous people could work together. But the issue is, is that those collaborations aren't gonna go well unless climate scientists acknowledge the relationship that indigenous people have to colonialism. So take the issue that a lot of indigenous people have to harvest uh, culturally and economically significant you know, plants and animals in secret because those activities are considered to be illegal by the settler state. Uh, if a scientist does a study and makes the results public that discloses the locations of those uh, plants or animals, then people could go and pillage that, and that's a risk to indigenous people. So climate scientists have to change how they think about the development of studies with indigenous people to avoid those risks, and have to take into consideration things like what can or can't be published uh, given the situations that indigenous people face. So a decolonized uh, climate science is actually one in which climate scientists are thinking about how their work can you know, both create new knowledge about climate change, but also how their work can actually support uh, getting the type of information that indigenous people need to maintain and improve their economies, their ways of life, and their political self-determination. And you talked about um, you could take the idea of inclusivity of indigenous people in climate science instead suggesting I guess it goes to that idea of decolonizing that rather than having you know one indigenous person participate in a conference it's about bringing uh, climate scientists to country to participate in ceremony and to learn stories what what difference does that make how, do, how might that yeah. change worldviews yeah that that's a good question uh, it makes a, a huge difference because you know one of the the myths out there is that uh, climate scientists are you know only uh, settler people or white people or, or western people or whatever term you want to use um, you know like I was saying earlier uh, indigenous people were engaging in empirical methods for the study of environmental change and climate change for years and years and years so uh, native people are also climate scientists um, we're not just people that may have a different perspective on what scientists do and should be included in a conference or two, we're actually people that in our own right are practicing climate science. So if you're going to have a dialogue between climate scientists and indigenous people, the climate scientists, those we typically call climate scientists today, need to actually come and see how they fit and within the long-standing tradition of indigenous climate science um, and vice, you know, vice versa. But it's typically, you know, that latter thing that native people have to go to climate scientists instead of the other way around. Yeah, and just on that, I mean, our readership and followers at Croaky are mainly health people, yeah. you know, people in public health or health professionals. How can the health sector engage usefully um, with the indigenous climate justice movements? So I think the health sector has a tremendous opportunity to support some of the projects that indigenous people are engaged in to understand the relationship between health and climate change. So if you look at a lot of um, uh, climate change uh, uh, media and discourse, you know, it's a lot about economic loss. Uh, but for indigenous people, there's certain types of health concerns that are related to climate change that are not well understood. I mean, indigenous people, people in tribes, um, you know, understand them or understand their importance, but a lot of scientists don't study these things. You know, so for example, what is the impact of, uh, of mental health uh, in relation to changing landscapes and how do mental health issues affect uh, indigenous sovereignty. Uh, for a lot of native people that's a huge climate change issue and so that would require uh, health researchers and people concerned about health to try to understand those relationships or how is it that the loss of a culturally 
uh, significant species affects nutrition um, and then how does that affect some of the trends that we see in need of health concerning things like diabetes and so on and so how is it that climate change can be seen as a nutritional issue for tribes um, even though for a lot of non-indigenous people we don't typically think of nutrition and climate change uh, as related um, and so I think those are these kind of integrated uh, holistic health questions that researchers really have a tremendous opportunity to address um, and I hope that many do uh, begin to work with tribes um, on that nexus. Um, just before we end up, <clears throat> you're obviously very active online. How can people find out more about your work? Uh, so I do have a website which is uh, Kyle White, so K-Y-L-E White, W-H-Y-T-E dot uh, Cal, C-A-L, which stands for College of Arts and Letters, uh, dot M-S-C-U dot E-D-U, that's Michigan State University dot E-D-U, or you can just Google me, Kyle White, White spelled funny, W-H-Y-T-E. And you're on Twitter as well? Uh, I just started uh, using Twitter, um, so I can be followed on Twitter at, at Kyle Powis White, Powis P-O-W-Y-S, that's my middle name, uh, and I have a public site on Facebook, which is just Kyle White Facebook, and if you see the, the, the beard, um, you'll know you're at <laughs> the right you. place. Yeah. Great. Look, thank you very much, and we hope to have a report on your work as part of our Just Climate series at Crokey. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.